have a bad habit of biting off more than I can chew, oftentimes, when I try to preach in one sitting, but uh, I guess for me, I'm standing, you're sitting, but uh, last time I realized it going in, there's a lot here in James 1, and uh, so a couple weeks ago, I preached from this passage, we did part one on enduring and trials, and this evening I'd like to pick it up, part two, James chapter one, and the beginning of verse number two, we're going to read down to verse number 12. It says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers, various temptations or testings, knowing this, that the trying of your faith work in patience, but let patience have a perfect word, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting, lacking, nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But the brother of low degree rejoice in that he's exalted, but the rich in that he's made low. Because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away, for the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of the perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them with love him. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our time. Father, we come to you together today. We're thankful for this passage of scripture. Lord, you've been here tonight. We have several who are in the midst of trials. Lord, all of us will face testings, or sometimes physical often spiritual. Lord, we just ask tonight that you would put some things in our heart from your word that will help to guide our paths through those testing times. Lord, we need you. Pray that you would give us wisdom tonight to take hold of these moments. Pray for your Holy Spirit. Fill me and use me. Lord, I pray that you would fill every part of life that we might glean from your word and behold wonderful things out of it tonight. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you gave us your word to instruct us and Pray that you have blessed these moments in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4 is a section that we covered a couple weeks ago. There were three things in these verses that we were instructed about in the midst of our trials, in those difficult times and what we face in life. The first instruction we received in verse number 2 is that we were to count in all joy when we fall into different temptations. This idea of testing through trials. Count. To put it in, as we said that night, to put it in, to file it in the joy file, right? Put it in the joy category. File the trial in the joy category. He then goes on to explain why. He says to consider some things. He tells verse number three, the word to consider that the trying or the testing of our faith works patience, endurance. It's not something that our world esteems very highly, but it's something that our God esteems very highly. He wants to work endurance in us. We are told to run the race of Christian life with patience. That is with endurance. That's how the Lord wants us to live. Have that enduring Christian life. Having that enduring testimony. Having that endurance that comes by a love for Christ. We'll see about that a little bit later. And then the third thing that he tells us, and the great reason, the great necessity for patience, is because uh, when we comply with patience, then patience in its perfect work does a work in us which causes us to come to maturity in our Christian life, that we would be perfect and entire wanting or lacking nothing. So we can see how important it is that we would experience endurance, that we would be maturing in our Christian lives. We notice in this passage he goes on, and he deals still with those in the midst of testing times, the midst of trying times, doesn't conclude that until verse number 12. He moves on now from that reminder here to a request in verse 5. Notice what he tells us in the midst of those trials, what he encourages us to do. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. If any of you lack. Our requests are due to the fact that we lack. We are needy people. Do you know why we struggle to pray? Why our prayer closets grow cold? 
because we often fail to see ourselves as needy. One of the great things about trials is it helps us to see we need the Lord. We need His hand. We need His work. We need His strength. We need His enabling. We need His healing. Whatever it might be, the trial helps us to see I am needy. How important that is. Because we're reminded that God gives grace to the humble. He pours out His blessing upon those who seek Him. David made it simple in Psalm 34 and verse number 6 where he said, This poor man cried. And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. He saw himself as a poor man. He saw himself as a needy man. And in that need, he cried out to the Lord and the Lord supplied. I'm so glad today that we have a God who's ready to meet the need when we see it. Praise the Lord for that. However, in Christ, we see in this passage that there's a lot that we don't lack. I, I, want, I want to point that out. In Christ, we often ask in trials... And often through life, we ask for things that God's already given. Sometimes we'll ask for power. The Bible tells us we have power. The power of the person of the Holy Spirit. Can I say you can't get any more power than that? Because the Holy Spirit is God. And in God, we have all the power of the universe. He's omnipotent. We never need to ask for power. What we need to ask is for the Holy Spirit's filling. There are things that we have been given by God. We are told in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Christ has that strength that we need. Again, when you get saved, you have all of Christ that you're ever going to get. And so you have all of the strength in Him that we are going to get. So much of what we ask for, we're told we already possess. Think about that. And again, the reminder is, because Christ said, Lo, I am with you always. Because He's with us, we have so much already. We cannot have any more or less of Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit who dwells us permanently. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He has made you his dwelling place. So once uh, again, understand we have a lot already. I once read an interpretation of this passage. It says we don't need to ask God for anything but wisdom. We don't need to ask God for grace because God supplied that. We don't need to ask God for mercy. However, I disagree with those statements. We're told in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, that we are to come boldly to what? A throne of grace that we may find, or that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So what we see is, as the Bible says, he giveth more grace. We have all the power in the Holy Spirit where we're going to get, but God gives grace to the trial for those who will seek his face and ask for it. So it's not that we only ask for wisdom, but that, that, we, that we should ask for wisdom. Here's what we often lack in the trial. How often do we pray in the midst of the trial and say, Lord, give me wisdom in this trial. Give me wisdom in this test. Usually what we're asking right away is, Lord, take this thing from me, right? <laughs> Lord, give, help, me, help me to get past this. Get this trial out of my life. But notice here in James, and this is almost counterintuitive, right? We don't, we don't often ask for, Lord, give me wisdom in this trial. But when we notice that God has intended through those trials to strengthen us and to bring us by patience to maturity, and what we see is, hey, we need wisdom. What is the wisdom that we need? Well, we need wisdom to see our trials for what they are. We need our wisdom, we need God's wisdom, so we can see the trials for what they are. The trials are not a curse from God. The trials do not come because God's forsaken us. But rather, God allows trials to refine us. So we would come forth as gold. We realize that. We need wisdom to see it for what it is. We need wisdom to enter into all the Lord has provided. Because he has given us power and strength and the person of the Holy Spirit, we need the wisdom to enter into those things. Have you ever been given something and not know how to use it? I have. I remember my wife a few years ago, she got a new can opener. Seems simple, right? But we left behind the old can opener, you know, the one that comes on the side, you got your can here, and it goes on the side, and it goes all the way around like that. For some reason, she decided to upgrade. I, I didn't know how to work this thing. The thing sat on the top, and you squeezed it, and it cut a whole different direction. I said, you know, I'm trying to put it on the side. I don't know how to use this thing. I needed my wife's help to give me some wisdom to show me how to get into that can of goodness that I was trying to open up, you know what I'm talking about, and to feed my hungry belly. I needed wisdom. I didn't need a can opener. I had that. I just needed to know how to use it. You know what? We need wisdom to be able to use what God's given us to use. That's what we often lack. 
know, as God's people, we have so much that we've been given in Jesus Christ. We just fail to know how to use to fail to know how to use the Word of God. To fail to know how to enter into the right kind of faith and, and the right kind of trust and to see that peace of God rule in our hearts. Oh, how we need wisdom. And so that's why he encouraged us to pray. And no doubt we also need this simple wisdom, don't we? But in the trial, we cling to God. That we cling to Him. We say, Lord, I don't know why this trial is here. And I don't know exactly when it's going to end. And, and I don't even know what you're trying to do in me through this. But I'm going to trust you. And I'm not going to let anything discourage me from that. And I'm never going to stop trusting you. We need the wisdom to just cling to God. You know, in this passage, again, he doesn't instruct us to ask the Lord to remove the trial, but for wisdom to be bestowed in the trial. Now, again, it's not that it's wrong for us to ask that. It's that sometimes we're just not spiritually minded enough to realize, well, maybe God has us here for a greater purpose. Maybe, and by the way, I would pray, Lord, give me wisdom to be able to see this trial for its worth. But Lord, also, in your mercy and in your time, would you remove this from me? It's not wrong to ask that. I'm not telling you not to pray that the Lord would take away the trial, but ask that God would give us wisdom and that we would submit and say, Father, in thy will. Even even as Jesus prayed, right? He says, if it's possible, right? Take this cup from me. Lord, if it's thy will, take this cup from me, this testing time. So we notice in this passage, we're told to ask for wisdom. Again, notice we're told in verse 5, seems straightforward, but sometimes we miss it in our practice. Look what he says. If any man not like wisdom, let him ask of God. You know, we, we often go to the wrong place when we're looking for wisdom. We go to the to the new book that's out, you know, that we see in the checkout line, the new bestseller over here. We look at, at this person and we say, oh, they're, they're a, uh, a wealth of wisdom. <clears throat> and you know what? Maybe God has given them wisdom for you. And I'm not saying it's wrong to go and try to find counsel from somebody, but never, never mistake their counsel for God's counsel, the sense that you go to God first. You always seek it. Lord, would you please supply good counsel to me? Would you give me wisdom from your word as this person shares wisdom with, with, with me, with their ideas? Lord, would you give me peace that this is from you? But what we need to ask of God, you know, he is our rock, he's our refreshment, it's only Jesus who can supply. And aren't you glad in this verse what it says? That if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally. What a wonderful phrase that is. He given to all men liberally. Aren't you glad it doesn't say he rewarded? <laughs> it's grace. It's not something that we deserve. It's not something that we have to earn. It's not something we have to say, all right, well, Lord, I'll endure for a while, or Lord, I'll go out and do a hundred good deeds, and, and then he'll give it to me. No, he give it. Notice again, he says, to all men. You know what? This isn't just for me. This isn't just for the deacons. This is for everybody. Yeah. This is for everyone. He says the Lord gives to all men. And again, the word there, <clears throat> liberal. Aren't you thankful that he gives it bountifully? That he gives it in abundance? What we see in this verse is that the issue so often is in us. It's not that our God doesn't give answer to prayer. It's that we don't ask. Yeah. But James 4 puts it that way. He says he have not. Because he asks not. Our God, in his grace, in his mercy, that he gives to all men liberally. What a wonderful phrase. And I'm, by the way, I don't think that's true of just wisdom, but I believe that's true of grace. We go to that throne of mercy. God gives to all men liberally. I'm so thankful for that, that that's the God that we serve, and that's what we need to remember. And by the way, that should encourage us to pray even more. And God gives to all men liberally. Well, Lord, I'm one of those small people, right? I fit in that category, praise God. Lord, would you supply this? Lord, would you give me that wisdom? Would you give me the grace of this trial? Notice again in this passage in verse number 5. It says he gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. It means that God is not going to chide us. He's not going to revile us for asking him. I'll tell you, I'll be honest for a moment here. There's times where I get weary with requests, you know? Dad, can I have this? Can I have this? Can I have this? Can I have this? And finally, I quit asking, you know? I, I, I can't take you. Quit asking me. Just give me a break for a while. Just go that way. I'll go this way. Go chop down a tree or something out in the woods, you know? Just leave me alone for a little while. Quit asking. You know what? Our God never gets there. 
Our God never gets weary of our asking. And if we ask against His will and we know what God's will is, that's not something that God's going to bless. But praise God, He never gets weary of our asking. We can come again and again and again and again. He upbraideth not. We see in verse number 5, it shall be given him. It's a promise that the Lord makes. Aren't you thankful for his promises? This verse is rich. It's full of promises. If any man lack wisdom, but an ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Here's something. You seek God. You ask God for wisdom. You go in faith. And the Bible says God's going to supply you. Praise God for that. Notice in this verse, Dan, in verse number 6, that he does give this requirement. Verses 6 through 8, we have a requirement, and that is this. Let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let him ask in faith. Remember the words that Jesus said. He says, all things, whatsoever you shall ask, believing, you shall receive. See in this verse that without faith, it is impossible to please him, isn't it? We have to come by faith. Isn't it amazing how often we can make a prayer request and not fully really believe that we're going to get what we're asking? Isn't that sad? That's the way the human heart operates, isn't it? Some of the things we pray for, maybe we think, well, you know, I know better. It's just not going to change anything. Or, this person here, they're so hard. Sometimes we ask, and it's just formula, it's just for, uh, formalistic. We're just going through the motions, praying and praying and praying and praying, without really even thinking about what we're doing. The Bible says they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. It's got to come from the heart. It's got to be genuine. It's, it's got to be in faith. That's what he tells us here. He tells us in the Word of God four times, the just shall live by faith. That's what God demands. It's what God blesses is faith. Again, he tells us in this verse, nothing wavering. The idea there has, to, has the idea of being in strife with oneself, to be in doubt, to hesitate, or to waver. Are we so often conflicted within ourselves? A trial forms on the horizon. We can wear ourselves out with questions like, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? We keep running around. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Lord, give me wisdom. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Lord, give me wisdom. We're not asking in faith. We're not trusting God. We're not taking the Lord and leaving it there. We're not casting all our cares on Him. We're not going to Him in faith. We're, we're asking, but we're not doing it in faith because we're not resting in His promise. God's going to give it. We're reminded here not to permit ourselves to fall into that trap. Don't get overwhelmed with worry. Worry is the opposite of faith. Rather than worry, ask wisdom from God and turn what am I going to do into the Lord's going to show me what to do. That's faith. You pray and you ask for wisdom, you say the Lord will show me in his time. I'm going to trust him. I'll continue to ask, Lord, in your time, would you show me what to do? Lord, in your way, show me how to go. He that wavered, the Bible tells us in verse number 6, is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. I said, oh boy, boy, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of examples, but now I live in Florida, I know what he's talking about, right? The waves come in, the waves go out, they're back and forth, they're back and forth, they're up and down, they're so much stable, isn't it interesting? Our God is a rock, he's firm, for us to go back and forth and doubt and faith and, and not be stable on him is, is to be unchristlike, and it does not bring glory to our God. The Lord does not want for us to have an up and down faith. His will is not that we should be back and forth in faith and fear from worry to confidence. Our God is a rock, let us abide steadfast in faith on him. Notice what he goes on now to make another promise. It tells us in verse number 7, the one that asks in unbelief, the one who goes back and forth, well, I don't know if God's going to do this, I don't know what's going to happen, back and forth, Notice what he says. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. We've got a negative promise there. If we don't ask in faith, if we're all full of worry, and we won't let God, uh, God have control of the situation, and we won't turn it over to him in faith, it says God's not going to give us what we're asking for. He made a promise here. That man will not receive anything of the Lord. What an awful thought. Can we learn that it's offensive to our Father for us to doubt Him? You know, our worry and our doubt 
calls into question, are God's faithful? That's a despicable thing, isn't it? We live by worry and doubt. How evil is that? May our response be that of the needy father who fell at the feet of the Lord Jesus. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Lord, my will is to believe you. Lord, you know my struggles, but Lord, I want to just believe. Take away that unbelief from me. As it says in verse number 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now I look at this verse, and I look at verse number 9 and 10, and I see verse number 7 before, and I wonder, is this verse, verse number 8, connected to verse 7, or is it connected more to verse number 9? No, really, it fits both. Relating to verse number 7, one who's double-minded is someone who's back and forth in trusting God versus trusting himself. That's double-mindedness. Am I going to give this to the Lord? Am I going to try to handle it myself? That's double-minded. Then he goes on, though, in verse number 9, he gives us another thing that someone might trust in. And that is, in verse 10, riches. A double-minded man is one who trusts, tries to trust in God and trust in riches. Say, so, you know what? I've got God, but just in case, I've got a nice bank account, too, you know? There's no just in case. It's either all God or it's nothing. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So he gives us here a bit of a reflection. Something for us to consider as we get to verses 9, 10, and 11. And you have to remember who James is writing to. Back in verse number 1, looking at the words, James, the servant of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, reading. He's writing in the first century. James here writing to a group of people who are enduring trials. And the trials that, that we're looking at in James 1 are not physical trials, but these are persecution trials, first and, and primarily. And so these are people dealing with persecution. So as he, as he speaks to them in the midst of their trials, look at verse number 9 when he says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because of the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. You'll notice here he does a comparison. The brother of low degree versus the rich. What I tell you, is it wrong today to be rich? The answer is no. It's not wrong to be rich. In fact, we find in Scripture several wealthy men that God used. I'm thankful for a man from the night that Jesus Christ had given his life, came and took the body of Jesus. Joseph Arimathea, a wealthy man. It took, it took somebody of wealth to have his own tomb put out of, or carved out into the cave in front of the stone as, as Joseph had. He was a wealthy man. We look at the Old Testament, we see God used Abraham, who walked by faith. He had great riches. Do you know that he had so many servants that he was able to go out and defeat an invading army with his servants? Abraham was a wealthy man that God used. It is not wrong to be rich. Notice in these verses there is a key word, which is going to be a distinction for you and I here tonight to help us understand these verses. Notice verse number 9. Look what it says. Look the brother. See that? That's a key word. Let the brother of low degree versus the rich. We're talking here about a brother who's being persecuted, a, a child of God who doesn't have anything left in this world versus the rich who is lost. That's the distinction. All right? The brother of low degree. The brother of low degree is exalted. It may not have happened yet in this life. If you're going through a testing time, you might say, you know, Pastor, the Bible says I'm a king. I don't feel like a king. You know? Uh, as, as we, even as the songs that we sing talks about the small cottage that we might have in this life. Hey, but, but you know what? Up above, I've got a, I've got a mansion, right? That's what God has already promised me. He's preparing for me. And that's a wonderful truth. But that, that's what the brother of low degree is looking forward to. He's exalted. He already has that as a promise. He's moving towards that heavenly city. He's just on a journey. He's not home yet. And so he's exalted. But the rich, in that he's made low. Because of the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. In these verses, we see this chief difference. The trials that these readers of James were facing, no doubt, often resulted in, in poverty. Not because they'd done anything wrong, but rather because they'd taken a stand for Jesus Christ. They were left with nothing. We find that early church, there were many people. If you read the book of Acts, 
You had men like Barnabas who came and gave all that they had to the church to help provide a multitude that didn't have anything. Much of that poverty was no doubt attributed, attributed to the rampant persecution of that day. But being a brother in the family of God was a much higher, nobler position than anything this world has to offer. I hope that you can sing that song, I'd rather have Jesus with great truth. I'd rather have Jesus. If our country took another turn, you know, we've got people today who are faced with outrageous fines for taking a stand for their faith. Right. We've had people who have been fined about a quarter of a million dollars for simply trying to live out their own convictions, their Christianity, in the United States of America. Right. Would you be willing to make such a sacrifice? Would you be willing to say, I'd rather have Jesus? Look, you can have it all. I want to stake my stand for him. Hey, that's what... Uh, generations of believers have done for centuries. You and I haven't faced persecution. We were the select few. Because that's not been the history of the church. This has been the history. And the brother of low degree says, you know what? I searched it for a city, a heavenly city like Abraham, that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. Those things can never be taken from me. Praise God, I'm a child of the king. All that the world offers will one day be gone. There's no guarantees except this. As Job said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. Right? Everybody is going back the same way. We're going back without a penny from this life. We can't take it with us. So here is something that we can learn in verses 9 through 11. Get this principle, all right? We rejoice in trials because what we lose in our trials was never going to last anymore. All right? Again, what we gain in a trial is eternal. You got that? That's why we rejoice in trials. Let me repeat that. What we lose in trials was never meant to last anyway. But what we gain in trials can never be lost. So that's why we rejoice. That's why we count it all joy. What we lose... It was going to be gone one day anyway. Yeah. What we gain will always be. There's nothing that can take it away. What a wonderful truth. In this passage, he concludes verse number 12 with this great reward. Look at what he says. Blessed. The New Testament word blessed, you could say happy. Happy is the man that endureth temptation. Blessed is the man. Makes it through those testings and trials by faith. They will count it all joy. Comes forth this gold. Notice what it says. For when he is tried, this is talking about a future test, the judgment seat of Christ, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Look at this great promise. Look at this great reward. Again, in this life, we may not get that. We may not see that blessing. The world goes through these trials, and, and they, they panic. They think, well, everything that's valuable to me, I'm losing. My health, my, my riches, everything that matters. But you know what? That's not what matters to us, is it? Because we're living for a future day. And here's what we gain as we endure. The crown of life. We notice in this passage, again, this final note. And that's the conclusion of verse number 12. It says, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Here. How we in all of this passage, here are those who endure in trials. It's those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. It's love that will not let go of Him. It's love that will not doubt Him. It's love that says, Lord, do with me and with my life and with my, with my things as you want to do. Lord, I love you. And I'll follow you that love that helps to overcome. And those who by love endure, those receive the crown of life, we're told in verse number 12. You know, I, I want to say today, we're all going to go through trials, right? Every single one of us. That's just life. Nobody, nobody's going to go through unscathed. We're all going to face it. Isn't it sad that sometimes we can emerge from a trial and have missed out on it? You know, how awful is it to go through a trial and then not get anything out of it? Yeah. How much better to be...
be able to endure a trial and to see through that trial us come to a greater spiritual maturity, as we see in verse number five, God to impart wisdom so that we trust him more for our uh, for heaven to sound sweeter all the time. And for us at the end to say, you know, I just love the Lord. He blessed me through this. And so that we have the crown of life awaiting on the other side. The reality is we're all going to go through trials. But are we going to endure them by faith and hope? Finding this passage that faith and that love really wrapped up in verse number 12 is the hope. Because he brings about that future time to crown of life. Those are the three things that abide, right? Now abide in faith, hope, and charity. These three, that love, the greatest of these is charity. That love that we have for God. That's what abides. Again, the riches of this world, even our health, it's all going to be gone one day. The things that people in our world glory in, None of it lasts, but all of this, this is stuff that abides. That's how we can make it through our trials. Faith, hope, and love, these three, the greatest of these is love. So let's just repeat this passage real quick as we conclude tonight. My brethren, count it all joy. Count it, understand, in verse number three, the importance of the test, the work of patience. Number four, comply. Let God go work in it'll bring you to maturity. Make the request for wisdom. Lord, show me through this trial how to trust you more. You see that we're to ask in faith. It's not to be something that we question whether God really is going to give the wisdom, but rather that we depend upon it. We count it as done. You see in verses 8 through 10 that we do not uh, look at the things of this life, the things that can be lost as valuable. Rather, those things that they gain through a trial, that is what is the true value so verse number 12, we rejoice because when we're tried, we receive that crown of life, which the Lord has promised to give to those who love him. There's a reward. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on this time. Father, we come to you tonight thankful for this opportunity to open your word. Thankful, Lord, that you have a purpose in our trials. What we all go through. Testing times. Lord, I, I find myself prone in those moments when first spring upon me. Lord, ask why. And yet, Father, I pray that you would instead bestow wisdom. But the first thing that we would ask, that I would ask, the first thing that I would go to is say, Lord, I trust you. You have purpose and plan. Lord, direct me in this. Lord, I pray for all of us that we would have such wisdom. Lord, you know what we lack tonight. Lord, you know what we face tonight. Lord, we know you know how we need to. I pray that we would just fill our hearts with such a love for you, with such a faith in your promises, with such a hope for the future, that we would endure. We would endure for your glory. Lord, bless this invitation tonight. May you use it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.